Hey guys, welcome back. I got another video for you, but do me a favor, guys. We're at six, almost 16,000 subscribers. We need to get to 20,000, so go ahead and hit that like, subscribe, that notification button, and many of you are leaving comments, and I appreciate a lot. So help us get to 20,000 subscribers. Now guys, in all these videos that I put out, you see that the captains and the crews don't know where their equipment's at. They don't have a plan. So what they're doing is they're struggling through. You even see them when they get under the cushions. They're having to tear the plastic up or take, you know, tear the plastic off or open up containers. And they don't even know, even know how to put their life jackets on. Let me tell you, there's nothing more scarier than knowing that when you're in that water, you can't get your life jacket on. You don't have time to take and figure things out. You got to know. I came along this video, this is from the Coast Guard, and this happened on August 11th of 2024 off the coast of New England. There was a fishing vessel, and it was an 81-footer, and it caught fire in the engine room. Now, there's nothing worse than on an airplane and on a boat than having a fire, because there's nowhere you can run. So they had planned, they had trained, they knew where the equipment was at, and within minutes they were off the boat, which saved their lives, and they were able to get rescued by the Coast Guard. Again, the importance of this video is just don't take it for granted about your safety equipment. You buy People buy it, they put it into the containers, you know, uh, up under the center console or whatever. You know, they don't know where the equipment's at. Know your equipment, have a plan, and I hope you guys enjoy this video. And bravo Zulu for the Coast Guard for saving these people's lives. So let's get to it. United States Coast Guard, United States Coast Guard. This is the fishing vessel Three Girls. My position is 4306-6800.1. We are on fire. We are going to be abandoning ship. We are going to be abandoning ship. No one, no one ever goes to sea wanting something like this to happen. But we all need to plan for something like this to happen. I was the captain and uh, owner of the fishing vessel Three Girls. I am a deckhand on the Maria Joanne right now. Um, and I was on the Three Girls when it went up. Yeah, good. There's the boat. We got off just to see the fuck out. Oh, we're good? Yeah, we're good. We were hauling back. We were nearing the trawl doors coming up on the side of the boat to, to start to haul the net back and out of the engine room exhaust just smoke just started pouring out of there. He looked at us, he opened that door, saw the flames, looked at us and said we're abandoning ship. There was no, oh we'll go down and try to fight it because like I said if we had done that someone would have died. It was, it was a fire that was was not going to be controlled with a few fire extinguishers. Went up to make the mayday call, which I could barely get off because the smoke had gone up into the, the wheelhouse and it, it was just the most toxic stuff you would ever breathed in your life. And I just made the mayday call, dropped the microphone and went out back and started, you know, we started assessing what we were gonna do from there. I remember I went up to the muster station and we grabbed the EPIRB. I set the EPIRB off. I remember hearing things exploding in the engine room, the compressor blew, and the winches started free spooling. I remember in my head thinking, any other time, that's an emergency, but right now it just doesn't matter. Um, and it was decided, we were at the muster station, like we can't be up here above the fire and all the smoke's rising. So Robbie's like, we'll get down on deck. Um, they went up and grabbed the life raft from the bow and brought it down. I had caught it with Rich. And, uh, and that in itself, like, with everything that you're doing, you're choking and your eyes are burning. You know, it's a fight just to get a breath of air. It's a fight just to see. So that fire makes it so much different. When we first heard the SAR call, I was obviously down in my rack on the bridge. They heard the uh, mayday call from the captain. Immediately, our deck watch officer on watch called the captain to the bridge. Whenever we as Coasties hear that mayday call, 
over the radio, everybody's adrenaline spikes and we want to get on scene and we want to do that mission that we are, a lot of us joined the Coast Guard to do. Um, and I could see that excitement in the faces of we're going to be able to help these people. You don't realize how small you are until you're inside this little balloon type, you know, the life raft in, in, in the big ocean and stuff, you know, and, you know, you knew you made the right calls and you knew people were coming and stuff like that, but it's just, you know, it's a big sense of relief that, you know, everybody's okay and, you know, that they're there to help you that I really, it was a beautiful situation and such a horrible situation because everybody was worried about everyone else. There was nobody taking their own safety and it, it was everyone looking out for everyone else. Are you all right? Like, we got smoke and fire coming and someone takes a minute to look at me, see are you all right? You good? We're all right, I'm waiting on the helicopter, whoever, but people know we're, people know we're in this situation, the E-perbs are off and stuff, so. Best worst case scenario. The fun thing about that night was there was nearly zero illumination. So all I really saw was the flashing white light of their, um, their life raft. So started heading, making best speed. I was trying to go as fast as I could. The sea state was probably around four feet waves. Um, so we couldn't head, we couldn't get there too fast. I remember looking down, I was going about 20 knots um, and really just kind of squinting, trying to see that strobe light. One thing I remember going in my head was like, don't steer directly at this strobe light because I didn't want to accidentally hit them. I really couldn't see anything else. I couldn't really completely judge the distance. Um, so I steered a little bit to my port, keeping the uh, strobe light off my starboard side. As soon as we got up close, we turned on all of our lights. We were able to see them. Everyone was in pretty good spirits. Um, they were obviously a little rattled, but we pulled up alongside my MK2 um, grabbed one of the life raft, or one of the people on the life raft. He like grabbed their hand to help pull them in a little bit closer to us. The MK1, she was acting as the surface swimmer if we needed her to get into the water to kind of swim over. Um, so she held onto the life raft. One of the crew members held onto our boat, and then we just brought all six people onto our boat and then headed back to the cutter. We just sat there, you know, watching the lights and the horizon get bigger as people were coming to us. Um, it was actually a, a fishing boat that was to us first, but um, you could see out the corner of my eye, there was a, the cutter was there too. So um, we just had the fishing boat back up and let the, I knew it would be a lot easier getting on the Coast Guard, little small boat, you know, which, uh, there was big smiles when they when they showed up, that's for sure. <laughs> I was happy to see them. This was my first SAR case, which so it was pretty exciting. Um, I think it was extremely successful and I give majority of the credit to the captain of the vessel. Um, if we hadn't gotten that immediate mayday call with a position, we wouldn't have known exactly where he was. This was the most prepared I'd ever seen anybody. Uh, they not only gave us the mayday call with a position that we were able to get on scene with immediately, they had an EPIRB that was giving us a position. So comparing those positions, we were able to get a drift rate of how their, um, their life raft was moving, but they were also in the life raft. They had their sea anchor, which was preventing them from moving too far from the initial spot. And then they were shooting flares off. They were able to uh, get their personal protective equipment on of their dry suits. They were, their ability to quickly abandon ship in the proper way allowed us to make sure that if anything did go wrong and they needed to stay in the water, they still would have been safe for a while. When we actually got all the fishermen on board, um, you know, obviously blankets, food, coffee, all of that was great. But I was walking across the mess deck and DC2 Benson is pulling uh, chew tobacco out of his pocket that he brought underway for his personal use and giving it to the fishermen um, to make sure that they were taken care of in even the weirdest littlest ways um, to make their time on board more comfortable. I think the biggest piece of advice is to take safety seriously. 
Um, something as a boarding officer, something I always tell people when they ask me like, oh, hey, why are you doing these boardings? Why do you have to see all of our safety equipment? Unlike where if you're driving in your car, you can just pull to the side of the road. When you're on a boat in the middle of the ocean, there is no pulling over to the side of the road. So you have to be completely self-sufficient, able to save your own life, and then we will be able to come out and rescue you from there.